The Open Therapy Institute is addressing bias in mental health care. Go to our website, opentherapyinstitute.org. We have CE credit workshops about overlooked issues in the field. You can go to our workshop page and register now and become a member. And for those looking for a therapist, we match people with someone who's highly skilled and truly open. Just contact us through the contact page on the website or email us at info at opentherapyinstitute.org. Hello, I'm Leslie Elliott Boyce from the Radical Center. I'm Andrew Hartz from the Open Therapy Institute. And today we're going to have a discussion about censorship culture and self-censorship and what contributes to a culture in which people feel that they can't speak openly and freely. And so I'm really interested in your thoughts on this issue. Thanks. Yeah, a part of we just were talking about this issue about wanting to popularize the use of the term censorship culture um, to act um, more accurately describe what's happening and what people experience. Um, you know, it, it, cultures can be created to foster dialogue and they can be created to thwart dialogue. And the ways they send those signals can be, um, sometimes they're explicit. There's a speech code. You violate the speech code, you get expelled, you get fired. Uh, sometimes that happens. Um, uh, a lot of the time, though, uh, they're more subtle. Um, I think one of the main ways that they're created is institutions will have vague rules that you can't say or do things that are racist or sexist. And because no, those are contested terms, people differ wildly on what they think racism and sexism mean. So to some people, if you want less immigration, that's racist. Uh, to some people, if you think um, affirmative action is wrong, that's racist. Um, to some people, hatred of white people and aggression against white people is not racist. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, th th there's so many different ideas about what they mean. So we, you don't know what it means. Um, and so most people in those contexts just defer to authority. Um, whatever the people in charge seem to be saying, they'll think is acceptable and what they're not saying they'll think is not. Um, and so if the company has like DEI programs that are teaching that hatred of white people isn't racist and it's good for all races except white people to be proud or something like that, um, people get a sense of this is how, this is what they mean by racism. Um, and then they walk on eggshells about anything else or censor other things. Um, but I think there's other, other ways that this gets enforced. I mean, one thing is the enforcement of these rules tends to be really inconsistent. So sometimes people can make a comment and nothing happens. And something that somebody else makes a very similar content comment and they get the whirlwind. And so that not knowing what's gonna happen when is really um, unnerving to people. Um, if in, in behaviorism in like, reinforcement schedules. Mm -hmm. The the reinforcement schedules that are the hardest are um, variable. Mm -hmm. So like you don't know when the punishment's going to come uh, or when the reinforcement's going to come. Those tend to be uh, very, very powerful. And people will actually censor more if the rules are kept vague and enforced sporadically than if the rules are clear and enforced consistently. So it, they really can create a culture of fear. Um, one thing that was kind of inspiring to me about this or that I kind of, I, I was, as I was doing my training at a place that I thought had a censorship culture, I was reading this book called Bridge on the Drina, which was um, about Bosnia uh, in the, from like the 1400s to the 1900s or something. And it was a novel about just how this town developed mm -hmm. and it's particularly how this bridge over a river in the town developed. Now they were occupied by the Ottoman Turks and they wanted to build this bridge. And when they started building it, the people in the town who hated the, the Ottomans started picking the bridge apart at night and un working slow and undermining progress. And they were kind of undermining the project. So what the leaders decided to do, what the leader building the bridge did, 
um, was he found one person who seemed to be lagging or undermining things. It wasn't really important whether or not he was guilty. Um, and he very publicly and gruesomely tortured the person to death. There was this horrific description of like basically him being impaled slowly mm -hmm. uh, over a period of like 20 hours and like yeah. having just these distorted screams that like haunted the village. Mm -hmm. And then the next day they got to work and they built the bridge. Mm -hmm. um, it was how you break people. Mm -hmm. you, you don't need to do a lot to traumatize people into obedience. A, a couple examples of really viciously ruining somebody's life over nothing can make an entire society uh, terrified. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of institutions like you capriciously ruin somebody's career reputation over something meaningless. You don't need to do that hundreds of times you can do it once mm -hmm. and your 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 culture will now be a censorship culture will be a culture of fear um it doesn't take a lot um dialogue is really hard to cultivate even when people want to cultivate it um you actually have to work to hear both sides and actively engage and get feedback and it's hard to sustain and cultivate dialogue it's really easy to create fear and intimidation in these authoritarian cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, what else should I say? I think like I guess I'll say the the other thing that I think is like um, thinking about what fosters people to actually censor. Um, it's not. It's not always the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. you, that might be big in people's minds of I don't want to be canceled and ruined. Um, but a lot of times what they're worried about is they don't want the antagonism. They don't want conflict. Like when I was teaching a, gr a graduate level class or an undergraduate level class, I had these really beautiful slideshows mm -hmm. that I made that had all of this art in them to illustrate a different theory. Um, and then it was, I started thinking, Nobody told me there's no rule about this, but I started thinking it's all European art mm. or it's mostly European art. Am I going to get attacked for this? I don't know. And so I'm kind of guessing what's the percentage chance that someone in the class wants to fight about this and creates a huge conflict in the class that could spiral into something bigger or at least make my semester terrible. And then I just decide I'll just take it off mm -hmm. because I don't, I don't, it, I don't want to risk it. And so now the lecture just won't have that art. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and nobody's going to know cause I'm not going to tell anyone, but I don't know if, and the sad thing is, no, but they, the students might have loved it. Maybe no one was going to dislike it and everyone was going to love it and it was going to be a big hit. I don't know. Or maybe somebody was going to make a stink out of it, but it went nowhere. Or maybe it would have led to this, he's a racist professor thing and then I get attacked. I don't know. I don't know where it was going to go. But um, you have to calculate what do you want to risk or not. Mm -hmm. And I think there is this kind of mind reading of trying to guess what do I think might happen if I do A, B, or C. Now, even if I'm not worried about getting fired or I don't care if I'm getting get fired because I'm just an adjunct and I don't make that much money. And it's like, you know, so what? But I just don't want to deal with the conflict. And I don't want damage to my reputation. And I don't want to have a problem. So just take the reading off the syllabus. Just don't teach it. Don't teach that article that has the line in it that they're going to fixate on and attack you for. Don't teach the controversial topic. Don't have this. I mean, one of the things um, in one class, I wrote an article about this for Discourse, Discourse magazine like a year and a half ago or something, but it was, um, um, I, I had a 
thing in my lecture where I talked about gender and I was kind of like, it could either be socially constructed or it can be innate, but it can't, it's hard to say that people with a trans identity are born that way, but people with a cis identity, I know people hate that term, but I don't know what else to say, uh, cis identity, it's socially constructed. Mm hmm how how could how could trans be innate and cis be socially constructed mm -hmm. <laughs> there's they they can so you need a theory of how gender works that's consistent and so they they wrestled with it they didn't know how to respond it was challenging i knew it was challenging but i thought i could challenge them that's okay um but then a few weeks later i got attacked um, because I had done a case study and at the end of every class, I had a case study. It was a developmental psych class. And at the end of each class, I would have a case study trying to with with a patient who was of the age that we were discussing to try to like, highlight developmental struggles. Mm -hmm. And they said, I had too many female case studies. Too many of the patients who had case studies were women. Now, this was sexist because it pathologized women. Okay. And it showed that I had issues with women. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, if I hadn't had, if it had been the other way around, then I would have been excluding women and that would have been sexist too. And it just shows that I was being punished because I taught something else that was controversial that they couldn't refute. So they wanted to get me on something else. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter. It's like, if they want to file a complaint, if they want to gossip about me, if they want to have an uprising, it's just kind of like, and I knew, I guess, Part of what I walked away from that experience was, is that do I want to keep doing case studies? Because the case studies, they can count up the demographics and I will be pathologizing or excluding someone. There's no way to have over a 14 week class, a perfect representation, exactly proportional of every group mm -hmm. in like, I just can't do it. And so They'll, if they want to focus on that and attack that, they'll be able to. So it's like, do I want to keep doing the case studies? This is maybe I'm getting a little bit, but it's like, this is, I think, more the way that censorship cultures work. It's a lot of like the indirect stuff, the trying to guess what people think, the mind reading, the way that signals get sent subtly and overtly to, to create um, a culture of fear that I think most people um, mm -hmm. these days live in. Yeah, so censorship as a as a voluntary limitation of one's behavior or speech in order to avoid embarrassment or conflict. And when I think I, it's, it's one of the things that I wonder is how, when our audience grows, we tend to censor more, we flatten. And I, I'm wondering, again, the, the scale of things that we do things on right now. We're, mm -hmm. So much is very public. So much of like, I mean, being a professor, it's it, it would be different if you were talking to a small class of like eight graduate students versus a a big auditorium full of, you know, a hundred people or, or more. Um, how how that might impact your messaging, like your how much of your creativity might you reduce and how much more careful might you be about your speech versus if you're in a smaller group where you can kind of, there's, you can develop some trust and some understanding among each other that gives you the room to be more creative and to, um, to add more, uh, like the flourish, the art, that that's one example, or to do yeah. those case studies. Everything of like just the joy, creativity, mm -hmm. spontaneity, humor, fun, looseness, and people get in the habit of thinking twice before they do anything. Um, and it just makes the whole thing more stifled and I think bitter and less fun, less creative, mm -hmm. less, less useful. Um, I think it's just like it, it really, when people are in that censorship mode, it, they're in a just a place to like collaborate less well, mm -hmm. to be less inspired. Is it a necessary byproduct of scale, do you think? Um, and how much, how much so, if so? Um, 
Yeah. Well, what's the effect? What's the cause? Is it that people, uh, it's that if you're attacked at a bigger scale, that's harder to um, defend against, or people are more afraid of losing their, what they have if they're at a higher level? Yeah, perhaps some of that. And also per when you describe the the calculation you were doing with your art on your slideshows and you're thinking what's the percent chance that somebody in this room is going to have a problem well right. if your audience is larger than i you know you're talking with more people and you're and you know them less well so that trust goes down so you're in a lower trust environment and so right some of that i'm wondering if that could relate in that if some of our censorship is due to our sense that we have a broader, more diverse audience. And so we need to sort of narrow our message. Um, but then I think you're talking about something else as well, which is the professional censorship. Like this is something that I've been very intrigued by over the last five years or so. We saw this happen with COVID for instance, among doctors where doctors weren't willing to take a stand and a few did and they were made example of like right. the guy on the bridge you know you talk about this like we had these public excoriations of people who dared to stand up and say i don't think these statistics are right or i don't think that the masks are going to work or whatever it, it right, was right, right. and and so then professionals and i think for a lot of people they've lost a lot of trust in the medical profession because it seems like these are these are individuals who are highly trained and highly intelligent and should be able to master a conflict that's of a, a similar quality, different nature, but a similar right. quality to the conflict you raised with gender. Like, how can it both be socially constructed and also um, innate? You know, if so the, right, the medical right, right, issue right. was, was of, of a similar quality, and yet our doctors couldn't take a stand on that. Well, and you get you get failing institutions because people have all these blind spots. They don't even know what their blind spots are because nobody's going to tell them because everybody's afraid. And so you get bad care and it can just spiral mm -hmm. in bad quality. I mean, that the, the censorship cultures, I mean, they have so many costs mm -hmm. that are really severe. You really want to have a dialogue culture where people can speak up and maybe get things wrong. And as long as it's well-intentioned, like feel secure and even valued for raising difficult points, that's how you get the best outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's also how you understand the world best, how you, you have a more creative, loose environment where people, I think, tend to be happier and get along better. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just... I mean, there's also a lot of individual differences in terms of like who self-censors and why, like some people are more risk averse and um, sometimes, I mean, one, one reason to be afraid is like, if you speak up and say something controversial and then you get these super aggressive people screaming in your face, mm -hmm. what's the chance that you scream back or you say something, you say the wrong thing? Mm -hmm or you're put on the spot in this really aggressive way and you slip up, mm -hmm. you know, people who want to ruin you can say, well, I wasn't upset with what you started with, mm -hmm. but your response afterwards is what I'm upset with. But it's like when you've got a bunch of people screaming at your face, trying to ruin your life and trying to like, and it's like being incredibly rude and they somehow never get consequences for that behavior. Um, but if you don't handle it in a saintly way, way um so i think there's all different types of like worried about and indirect punishments is a big one too mm -hmm. like um does um like if you say something and then they're like like what happened in my class like i can't get you on that mm -hmm. i'm going to manufacture something else to try to get you on mm -hmm. but you're gonna you're gonna face a consequence because you said something that i didn't want to hear mm -hmm. And uh, I can't just, I can't argue with that, but what's the chance that you, if you, you tell a joke or you have a read, then, then they'll go after your reading list. Hey, look, the reading list is too many white males. This guy's mm -hmm. a racist, you know, whatever it is. So they can get you indirectly. Um, and you find out all of a sudden you have problems that you never had before and there's gossip and people are treating you different because now, now you have a reputation as a racist because, and it's and it's because you made a comment that they couldn't dispute 
it's it's like it's all this constellation of like bullshit that people don't want to deal with and um and i think it's led to it's entrenched it's it's honestly now i think after a decade of this it's the default setting of american politics like if you go to a new employer and you don't know anything about what the culture at that place is you're probably safest assuming that it's a censorship culture in the dei Mm-hmm. brand like mm-hmm. that's just what you're going to assume if you don't know anything else and if they want to create a different culture that's a dialogue culture they will have to work very hard to do that mm-hmm. um which is risky for them too because something could happen you know um but the the default is censorship culture now so you don't they don't actually need to do anything to foster that I, i'll say i <laughs> I had a training placement that I found out in my interview was a censorship culture. Mm. And I'll tell you the question that I was asked on interview that said, this is a censorship culture. It shows how subtle this stuff can be. But there was an interview question that said, what would I do if I was running a group and someone in the group said something that was racist? Mm. And I thought a couple of things. First off, this person seems to think it's obvious what's racist and what's not. Only people who think that are people who are really baked in the ideology. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No sense of like, that's an unclear term. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and also no sociopolitical awareness. Mm -hmm. Because if you did, you'd know that like people with a conservative viewpoint on those issues are not going to feel comfortable sharing that on an interview at a place that clearly skews left politically. So um, so no zero sociopolitical awareness, kind of assumptions about what's racist and what's not that are kind of like not, and that needs to be dealt with in a particular way. There's kinds of, even though there's nothing I think necessarily wrong with the question per se mm-hmm. about what do you think somebody should do? And it's like, hey, I'm leaving it open. But it, it's you can get all of these signals that are sent mm-hmm. that are like, OK, I get it. Mm-hmm. This is a place where you have an ideology. You don't understand why anybody would disagree. You're pretty baked into it. And it's functionally a censorship culture. So mm-hmm. it's very easy to see these signals sent and um, and get the message that. You can't speak up at this point, you know, 2024, you don't even need to have that question to communicate that it's a censorship culture. If you never say anything about dialogue or viewpoint diversity, you should just like it's the Mm -hmm. default assumption. Yeah, that's a really loaded question. You're right. It, It does. It tells so much. And what are your thoughts on on how professionals in psychology and education have particularly fallen prey to this censorship culture uh, to the extent that they have. I I mean, I talk with a lot of people who uh, don't want to be, don't want to be public with their thoughts. I want a common email that I'll receive is thank you for these dialogues. I wish I could talk about this too, or, or sometimes somebody will email and I'll respond back inviting them to talk and they'll say, maybe uh, in the future, but right now, I just feel like I have too much to risk. But I, I want to just say thank you. One of my initial, it was it, so perplexing to me when I was still in graduate school and I was confronting this because the people who were teaching me about psychology should have been the very people who could have seen themselves doing this and seen through a lot of the the DEI, the the superficiality of the DEI um, ideology. It's just it was directly contradictory to the other psychological principles and concepts that they were teaching. And yet they were able to continue doing this. And I wondered about the cognitive dissonance that must have existed for them and whether it did and whether they were able to see the, the, the issue the way that I did and, and how much was, was it self-censorship. But is there any reason why people in these professions would be particularly prone to self-censorship or or should be right. censorship proof yeah i mean i i'm surprised because it seems like so much of what we do is trying to encourage other people to talk 
And not just in therapy, but often to be assertive with others and to say what you feel and speak up. And it's so much what we do in, in, in individual therapy and couples therapy and family therapy, communication skills, communication strategies, helping with how to communicate assertively. It's a pretty central part of a lot of treatments. And it's pretty shocking to see so many people in our field who seem unable to apply that um, and, and follow it. Um, I, I think, you know, part of this is like, what do people do when they're self-censoring, which is like a slightly different, different topic. But, um, I would say the first thing that people should do is connecting to others. That's step one, because when you're alone, a big part of being of self-censoring is being alone because you don't know who might agree with you or who might not. They don't know what you think necessarily. So being isolated is pretty central to the experience of self-censorship. Um, if you're connected to other people that you can be open with, it's a totally different game. You have a network, you have some supports, you can think strategically. Now, maybe you're at a training site or a program where you just like, it's hopeless and there's maybe like no nothing's going to happen if you speak up hypothetically but um on the other like there might also um there might be things that you could do at some of these there might be maybe you could suggest like i think we should have a speaker on viewpoint diversity mm -hmm. come you know i think we should have something about uh you know bias in the field, political, socio-political bias in the field mm -hmm. or something. And some places might say, okay, we could do, we could do a talk like that. Mm -hmm. um, or, and, and, and it's just a step-by-step -step thing. You don't have to single-handedly take everyone on. You know, I would, I would advise against that. Mm -hmm. um, but people can be strategic. I do think people often overestimate the risks of speaking up. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and I think that is related to that, you know, the bridge on the Adrena example, like there are these things that are really salient that are so active in people's minds that they see like this person sent a tweet that was obviously well-intentioned, but poorly worded and they lost their career and the reputation and all this money and got fired. And, and it's like, it just terrifies people. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the, it's, 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 it's pretty unlikely to happen. Um, if you do a podcast and you're expressing yourself in a, in a non, you know, in an assertive, constructive, positive way, I think it's actually unlikely for most people. Um, yeah. Do you, I don't know. Do you have thoughts about why there's so much self-censorship in our field? Um, I have wondered about that. I, I've wondered about uh, people who there seems to be a high uh, or a lot of imposter syndrome among counselors and therapists. I think that's mm. something that I encounter, especially with newer professionals. That's something that people talk about quite a bit. And so there's and I think that that's probably related to professional identity development, just um what does it mean to be sitting in the role of the of the listener of the counselor what is expected of you i think a lot of times people tend to to feel the need to really be a lot for their clients and and sense that they might not be enough and so i think that there can be an over reliance on the profession as a backdrop for one's identity for one's validity and I wonder how much this happens in professional circles. I have to imagine that this is probably quite common for doctors as well, that they're they're just, I mean, you're just a person. You're just doing the best that you can. But people come to you with such need and right. and with a, a lot of seriousness and a lot of investment in what, what you're doing and what you could do for them. And I think that at the end of the day, the end of the professional is just an individual with all with the same set of limitations and and um, with a lot of the same insecurities that that anybody else experiences. And yet there's so much pressure on them to perform. And so without that, when if that professional identity is 
threatened or the professional affiliation is threatened, they could lose so much because they, they would not just lose perhaps a job, but also a sense of who they are. And so I think that maybe there's more, when you say that the, the potential negative outcomes of speaking openly are sometimes overestimated or, or overblown. I think that maybe there's a lot of fear in there that's almost un, unnamed to the individual because so much of who they are rests on their professional affiliation. And I wonder how much that's the degree, to what degree that's the case for academics and other people who are in high status, high reputation positions, positions of authority where they've worked hard to see themselves as that thing. And a lot of their their esteem, both self-esteem and esteem from others, is related to their professional identity. So I, I, I've wondered about that. Yeah, yeah. I think that this, this is exactly what if I were treating somebody with self-censorship issues. I mean, this is exactly something that you kind of want to pin down is what is the fear exactly? Mm -hmm. How likely is that to really happen? Mm -hmm. And how much do you, and why, why are you afraid of that necessarily? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. right. Like if it's kind of like, Oh, I will lose standing a bunch of, among, a, among a bunch of people who I think are doing stuff that's immoral and who I don't respect. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, well, I, it, again, that can be active like on an unconscious level or a psychological level. But then you, when you think, when you see it, you're kind of like, yeah, that's not so important to me. How likely is it that you do a podcast where, you know, you speak carefully and, you know, you, you say what you feel and it's evidence-based and somebody tracks it down, doesn't like what you said on that podcast. And then they try to get your license revoked and go to the licensure board and find a, and then you lose. And I, I just, I don't, I don't know of one example of that happening. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, I think some of the fears are not reality based and they're actually rooted in these other types of unnamed anxieties but then they get channeled they get fixated on this kind of like fantasy of you know people coming to kill you in your apartment mm -hmm. that i think are are not like oh this therapist did a podcast and they criticized woke culture like let's kill him and it's like I mean, I don't want to be too dismissive of that because it's like it's crazier things have happened, but it's like I'm, I'm not sure it's as uh, as likely as um, some people might unconsciously f fear. Yeah, I think I think when you point to it being unconscious, I think that that's that seems to me to be a big part of it. It's that it's kind of these un these not fully articulated thoughts that. Uh, you know, this one person that I spoke with, I really enjoyed talking with him. He's an academic in Australia and uh, Jamie Roberts is his name. And he uh, has, he, he said something about how um, we are, I think he, it's probably almost a quote. We are remarkably good at knowing what the taboos of our, of our given culture are, even without them being explicitly stated to us. We're just, we can pick up on those taboos. I, no, it's definitely not a quote. He, he said it so much better. But mm -hmm. um, the, for instance, I even, I work in an office, I, I, I have an office space in a building that is all therapy offices and suites. And I am I'm not a licensed therapist. I work as a coach, but um, my name is right. up on that board with all those other names. And I have from time to time wondered if any of those people will see my name, if they maybe would recognize me and, and what backlash I might face for that, if, if any, because it's, you know, I live in a very blue area with, that's a hotbed of DEI kind of thinking. And right. will I not have my lease renewed? And that's always kind of a, a a realistic thing. There's it's those little the ways that when people don't like something that you've said, they can be less charitable to you on a whole bunch of other in a whole bunch of other areas. And like the the example that you gave of the the student who didn't like your 
your particular views on gender and then picked on you about having too many women in the slide. It's like it you're going to find a way to undermine someone if you want to. And if someone yeah. decides that they don't like something I've said and wants to take it uncharitably and then and then it you know, it could come back and and hurt me in other ways, or hurt me in terms of being able to lease spaces or be affiliated professionally, even to the extent that I am with these communities. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's also just, it is aversive to be judged or hated, uh, even if it's by people you don't necessarily know or respect, like mm -hmm. that is an aversive experience. Um, I don't, I don't know how often, how often it's really coming into, I think, and again, if it's happening 0.01% of the time, mm -hmm. that just like the bridge on the Drina, it has a psychological power that's really disproportionate to its likelihood of actually happening. It's like it's like the inverse of winning the lottery or something. It's like mm -hmm. it's still but it's still like very psychologically potent even if it's n not very likely. Um and I think that's not all the time. Sometimes people are in and everybody's situations different. Like mm -hmm. institutions vary really widely between being the extreme ideological places that are just obviously unreformable to places that would probably be open to this, some of this stuff if somebody suggested and everything in between. Um, there's just a really big range. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's this is why I, I think therapy should be the central part of the way that censorship gets this self-censorship culture gets addressed because people need a confidential space to think through these things. Is this my social anxiety? Are my fears reasonable? How do I strategize about what to do? Like, it's like, there's a lot of stuff to unpack that you can't do if you're isolated and can't talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there's so much more to say. Okay. So maybe we can save it for another conversation another and, and continue going. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks, Leslie.